Greetings and welcome to episode 139 of the Words About Games cast, the weekly video game podcast for Words About Games. I'm your host, Amy Alexander. I'm joined this week by Darth Robinson. I'm going to need to come up with my stiff name at some point. At some point. There's not an internet quiz you can take. Yeah, I'm sure there is, but they also want my like, details. Oh, so. it's just like, you know, the, the first two digits of your first name, the last two digits of your mother's maiden name. And you combine them. The last, it, the, the last one I saw was like first digits of my last name, first digits of my mother's maiden name, um, then the three digits off the back of my credit card. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then you have to get your Star Wars name, which is like the, the name of your bank plus the. Yeah, my bank was sword code. And... <laughs> or is that your droid name? <laughs> yeah, because then the numbers at the end are your sword code. Yeah. <laughs> How are you? Um, not well, but we'll gloss over that. Oh. Power on, because the people aren't here to learn about me, they're here to learn about the games. I feel like people learn more more about you than you might think from watching this show. Oh, I'm sure they do. More than they would ever, ever care to know. Possibly. <laughs> so, all right, in the spirit of powering on, because I need to ask you a question before we start. How, how are we going to do this? Because normally stories that we tell on this podcast, like we're fucking storytellers, stories that we, we talk about on this podcast are normally fairly segmented. It's like, yeah. this happened, and this happened, and this happened. But this, the five opening news stories, or well, four opening news stories plus one thing, they're all kind of linked. <laughs> it's like it's <laughs> one, one organization. <laughs> one leads into the other, which leads into the other. Basically, we're going to spend like three quarters of this podcast talking kind of about the same thing. Yeah, it, it, it's going to suck, but it's uh, for the p- people watching this, I think it's going to be the best way to go through it, is to basically go through it the way you've laid it out. And, sorry, but one, there's a lot of information about one small well, not a small market, but a one small area of the game. <laughs> There's a um, graph, company, okay? Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> There's a graph this week. <laughs> yeah. That's Gra- okay. Graphics are not something that we usually go into on this show, for obvious reasons. <laughs> no, but this has been brewing, I think, for a while now. Um, if anybody's wondering if we're going to talk about the Game Awards or the Kind of Funny Game Showcase, which is the time of recording, finished like 10 minutes ago, um... We're going to be doing separate videos on that. That's going to come out on Wednesday. This is purely about the news. The one big caveat to that is something that came from the Game Awards, which was the Epic Game Store, which we are going to launch into as I'll probably talk about for most of this podcast. So I'm going to start with Epic is starting a start. A rival Steam plans to attract users with free games. This is from Tom Senior and Fraser Brown over at PC Gamer. We learned more. This was, this was a new story written before the Game Awards and after the Game Awards happened. Obviously, we learned a lot more about the Epic Store because it launched at the same time as the Game Awards. Fortnite developer Epic Games is launching a new online shop called Epic Game Store. The store will offer an 88-12% developer-to-Epic revenue split compared to a 70-30 split on Steam for devs earning less than a certain amount. The less than a certain amount part will come up later. The Epic Game Store is launching soon with a collection of titles that will expand throughout 2019. And we know what some of those titles are, and they're uh, they're going all in on the on making a, a storefront. Let's put it that way. Epic is leaning hard on the revenue split disparity between Steam and their new CEO. CEO Tim Sweeney tells MCV that quote in our analysis, stores charging thirty percent are marking up their costs by three hundred to four hundred percent. End quote. The announcement also came with a graph to push the point, which the graph shows, which is the picture I showed you. Um, which shows that on Steam, uh, if you're using the Unreal Engine 4, you get a 65% revenue split. If you're using Unity, you get 70. If you're on Epic Game Store and you're a developer, you get an 88% revenue split. And the caveat with the Unity one, it doesn't include Unity upfront licensing fees. Continuing on with the story, games using any engine will be allowed on the store, though Epic will waive the license charge for games that, that use its Unreal Engine. Quote, We believe that creators, both games developers and content creators, are responsible for the games industry's enormous growth and vibrance, and should earn the lion's share of industry revenue, says Sweeney to MCV. Companies... P- companies? Companies Com- providing support... 
supporting services such as engines, stores, platforms, and payment processes are just here to help and should be priced accordingly, end quote. One way Epic Games plans to seduce players from other platforms is by throwing free stuff at them. The store will feature one free game every fortnight throughout 2019, funded by Epic, Tim Sweeney told GamesIndustry.biz. Epic also wants to use the store to bring game developers and marketers together using the Supporter Creator program. It's designed to reward influencers for making things related to a developer's games. Quote, Epic's Supporter Creator program is key to helping developers reach gamers. Content creators such as YouTube video makers, Twitch streamers, cosplayers, community builders and bloggers have become key influencers in gaming. Previously, most creators were not compensated by game developers for their work and instead had to rely on donations. By matchmaking creators with developers, the Epic Game Store makes it easier for players to discover games and rewards content creators for their efforts. End quote. And then there's some stuff about the... It won't have a forum because forums are garbage fire. So that was part one <laughs> of, uh, of five of everything that's been going down this week in the world of PC gaming. So naturally, we didn't bring in Tom or Russell, who are massive, like, massively PC-focused gamers. So we're just going to model through as best as we can between the two of us. <laughs> I don't play a lot of games on PC. I just don't know much about PC games. Um, I mean, you checked out the Epic Games Store, right? Right? <laughs> I checked the announcement. I haven't actually gotten on it. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> the EpicGames.com, the new Epic Games Store, downloads just like Steam. Um... The new Super Giant Games game is in early access on the Epic Game Store. Here it is. Uh, which you can hear our thoughts about on Wednesday in a video entitled Game Awards Reactions or something like that. I don't know, I haven't thought the title yet. Um, Ashen's up there. Um, there's a few games up there. They're only available on the Epic Game Store, not available on Steam. Uh, during the Game Awards, there was a lot of game and that games announced where they showed the logos. For like what platforms is coming out on, you know, where they show like the PS4, the Xbox One, the Switch, and it was the Epic Games logo, but there was no Steam logo on a lot of the games that were shown at the Game Awards. Uh, so they kind of gone all in on this um, Steam competitor, I guess. Indeed, it's about fucking time someone released a Steam waiting. competitor. <laughs> Been waiting for two years at least. I mean, when Discord did it, when they were like, "We're gonna have first on Discord," it's gonna be. A thing we're gonna get games and it's just like hasn't really taken off which i didn't think it would like yeah. after seeing the games list after seeing the level of like conversation and hype just around in it like at sundown fantastic game yeah isn't really gonna push people to jump to discord but epic games is pretty much starting in the same way steam did they have a big game fortnite which had its own launcher because they wanted to keep the revenue from it yeah because it's one of the most popular games on the planet um, uh, <laughs> much like half-life and counter-strike um and now they've started selling other people's games but the big difference is they're giving developers all developers a bigger cut of their pro of the profits that they're making so that's instantly got to get people going or developers just going shit why aren't we on epic games instead of steam because they're gonna come. Because it's like here's a free game. Here's another free game. Here's two. Here's two free games. Here's a free game every two weeks. That's a lot of games. <laughs> That's a lot of free games, um, for people who just have an Epic Games account, right? Okay, good. Good to know. Good input. Next up, <laughs> it's, it's good that we have this back and forth going. It's a. Uh, it's uh It's it's the banter that people really come for. Um. <laughs> Why do, why does Steam need a competitor? Well, Steam many reasons. <laughs> many, many reasons. Let me read you one of them. Oh, Valve's God. new Steam distribution agreement lets big game devs keep more of their profits. This is from Vicky Blake over at MCV. Sounds good when you first when you first read it. But Valve has announced changes to its Steam distribution agreement that enables developers of the platform's biggest games to retain more profit. Broadly in line with the profit share tiers across other platforms like Nintendo, PlayStation, and Xbox, Valve roughly takes a 30% cut of all game sales published on its PC digital platform. Now, however, Valve has agreed to drop its share to 25% once revenue passes $10 million, and then down to 20% for sales over $50 million. 
The changes, which apply from October 1st, 2018, will apply to all revenue, including in-game purchases in DLC. Quote, The value of a large network like Steam has many benefits that are contributed to and shared by all the participants. Finding the right balance to reflect those contributions is a tricky but important factor in a well-functioning network. It's always been apparent that successful games and their large audiences have a material impact on those network effects, so making sure Steam recognizes and continues to be an attractive platform. Reboot button. <laughs> Our hope is the change will reward the positive network effects generated by developers of big games, further aligning their interests with Steam and the community. Keith? Comments, yes. thoughts. Um, is it not backwards? Oh, no, I mean, I know fuck. kind of that was it, supposed I, to say. Yeah, I know it's kind of the way like a lot of like tax systems are running like in in, in the Western world at the moment, where the rich get richer, um, and the poorer get poorer. But shouldn't it be that they're giving um like lower um profit take? Like, shouldn't the lower rate be on the like? The like new the smaller indie developers, you mean the smaller indie grow. developers who need like money to survive. Yeah, and they're like the ones that like will probably see like a couple of grand profit or something in the first couple of days, as opposed to Red Dead. As opposed to yeah, well, we'll talk about that in a moment. But uh, yeah, if again a game like the biggest game ever like comes to PC, and it, like the only games that are going to pass ten million dollars and fifty million dollars are triple A games, right? Like. Let's just rip the, the plaster off and we're just going to get right into it. They're the only people who are going to benefit from this change because they're going to make even more money. I love Supergiant games, but I don't see their like, stuff bringing in like $50 million. Right, yeah, exactly. And like you have these two different approaches to, to, to making a storefront now in that. And we saw it when we talked about when we talked about the revenue split the 88 to 12 revenue split for uh, for Epic Games, because this was a thing we talked about a couple of months ago, which is what prompted us to speculate about Epic maybe making their own storefront and how good that would be, and now it's a reality. Um, they're like, give the money to the developers, give more money to the developers. We don't need the money. <laughs> like, we don't need the money. Give it to them. Uh, still in the back of, like, Epic's just like, what just, you... what, just, just park the next truck of money over here, please. Yeah, I've seen the Fortnite doll things you can get now. So. And yeah. the loot pinatas. The yeah. soft plushy loot pinatas. So yeah, they make them they're printing money with Fortnite and like Yeah. I mean like and then you've got Steam over here who's just like done an agreement where it's just like, oh, we're gonna keep the thirty percent split in place for indie games. And but if you're a really successful triple A game, you're gonna get more money. Because we think you deserve it. And don't get me wrong, AAA yeah. developers work really hard to make games and good on them for even selling like $50 million worth of revenue. But Steam doesn't necessarily need the money either. I don't know what Steam profits are like. And they, yeah, I can't get away with my head and thinking that this is a form of gatekeeping where they're keeping the 30% on the lower games to avoid like those things those things just aren't really games that appear on steam that this is like keep, right. the 30 percent keep is not keeping these things out no it's not a gatekeep like to get more people in because they'll be getting a bigger revenue split with like selling their shitty non-games for like 20 pence on on steam but like an extra 10 percent of 20 pence sold a hundred times by people who are curious doesn't amount to that much like oh. and it just it seems so but you're right you're right it seems so backwards for of steam to just be like we're going to give more money to the bigger developers who don't need the money mm -hmm. and we're going to keep the money away from the smaller independent developers who might be living on like on a on the tightrope right like just enough like maybe just getting enough to just keep going um or maybe not getting enough to keep going at all um whereas that extra 10 percent revenue boost could be could be huge for them if they just reverse this or if they just said actually you know what we can afford to just give you all 
eighty percent instead of seventy percent. So here, have it. And even if they did that and reversed it, they still wouldn't be. You'd still be better off as an independent developer going to the Epic Game Store and going, "Hey, we'll just sell our thing on on here." Yeah. Because don't you have to pay money hand? You have to pay like money down to like Steam anyway to put the game on the storefront. So it might just be easier to go to Epic and Discord. Yeah, I mean, it won't be in the short term because I'm sure because Epic's obviously curating their storefront right now. Um, Yeah. Whereas you just pay it on Steam and that's it. I think Epic Games will always curate their storefront. Um, But what I think that means in the long term is they're just going to avoid the games that we've both seen pop up on Steam with fairly like regularity um i think that's what they'll they'll go look to avoid um doing by curating it which is what steam would do in the first place i mean you could argue that there's more users on steam and more people will see the game if it's on steam but well (laughs) we'll get to that in a moment but first you don't just want our opinions though i know you come here for our opinions and our our tanks on the news but what if I told you we had the opinions of some indie developers as well? I would listen intently. So this is from Rebecca Valentine over at GamesIndustry.biz who talked to a boatload of indie game developers about the new revenue sharing tiers. So I'm going to read some quotes. Freya Home. Uh, there's a an accent above the E. I don't know what that means. Home? But I know it's not pronounced Homer. Because there's an accent above the E. Co-founder of Neat Corporation tweeted a decent summary of the majority of complaints. Quote, It seems to me like Steam's revenue share change isn't too bad of an idea, but some, including me to some extent, consider this to be a blatant middle finger to smaller developers, or, like a reverse tax bracket, meant to make the rich richer, which I suppose isn't wholly untrue. But the alternative is that the rich get even richer off Steam, not bringing more people to Steam at all, making it a less viable platform for everyone involved, including indies, as well as forcing players to another client that don't allow indies at all. Valve could likely afford a flat 20% for everyone, and that would help indies as well as AAA studios. However, I think we should at least be happy revenue share is getting better for developers, even if it doesn't help everyone just yet. So that was kind of a, a middle ground statement. See, I'm not all about finding cherry picking these things and finding the ones that agree with, with my yep. opinion. Yeah. I'll find them all, and we'll talk about them all. I disagree, but I can see where that person is coming from in terms of the. It is possible that this change was made to stop other developers doing an EA. Yeah. And just saying, well, why don't we just launch our own? PC mm-hmm. service because people will come to our PC service because they want to buy EA games. Yeah. Like Bethesda just left Steam to do Fallout 76 on their own launcher. Which, you know, it's probably... I mean, it, may, it would have made a buttload of money either way, but Steam's probably happy they don't have that garbage fire on their platform right now. Um, yeah, Steam's, actually, yeah. Steam's customer service lot, department. But that's a lot of refunds that they won't have to process. Yeah. Because obviously, it's Steam has a, a more robust refund policy, and it would probably have to be processing a lot of refunds as well as dealing with the customer complaints and the customer service team. Um, but it stops the likes of, of Ubisoft taking all of their games and going, "We're going to put this on UPlay and nowhere else." And I don't know, Square Enix maybe deciding that they want to do their own thing over on their new DRM slash storefront thing um there are a fair few games developers have their own storefront if you call it yeah so i can see where they're coming from in terms of wanting to sweeten the deal a bit for triple a developers but they likely could afford 20 percent for everybody so why not they just get 20 percent of everybody <laughs> like um and i I'm, I'm sure that this decision was taken before epic games was a thing because these decisions don't just happen overnight, right? Yeah, this was probably a reaction to uh, Bethesda. Yeah, but we'll probably not learn for a long time if we ever do. There'll be a book or a, or an article. Jason Shire will be all up in this. Um, <laughs> he's all up in most things about this. Anyway, you want more? Where do you do you want more opinions of indie developers? 
Um, look at you, cherry pick, cherry pick your favorite. I mean, I don't have a favorite. Um, we'll we'll leave that one. We'll leave the next one because that's going to come up in a new story in a moment. Uh, let's go to let's go to to serial tweeter Rami Ismail, uh, co-founder of Lampia. He's a great dude. You should follow him on Twitter. Quote, have things really gotten so bad for Valve in the ever more competitive storefront scene that they now have to subsidize big studios? Are they that undesirable for larger titles now that the larger titles tend to be able to launch their own stars? That's an excellent question. Good question. Do you think uh, at Steam would have replied to him with a detailed breakdown of, of no. an answer to that question? <laughs> Uh, Tyler Glale, creator of The End Is Nigh. I'm assuming it's not The End Is Night. And a number of other indie... It might be. <laughs> and a number of other indie games echoed Ismail's assessment when he remarked that the change kind of feels like we're basically just subsidizing Red Dead Redemption 2's eventual existence on Steam. But I mean, yeah, right? That's what this could be about. Maybe Rockstar were ready to, to, to launch their own launcher mm. for when they got Red Dead ready. And then Steam was just like, saw like hundreds of millions of dollars just disappearing into the night and just went, whoa, whoa hold your horses. We got this. We'll, we'll do this for you. But even then, that doesn't explain why they wouldn't just, I guess greed would explain why they would just say, oh, just for the big games though. Yeah. Just for the big games. Keith, let's move on. Actually, finally, a word from indie publisher Devolver Digital's fictitious, yet still official executive, Falk Parker, who said, quote, If no one buys your game, then Valve gets zero percent, and that, indie developers, is how you stick it to the man, end quote. Wise words from a fictitious character. <laughs> that's like that meme isn't it it's like they, they can't arrest you for driving if you don't drive yeah pretty much anyway we've got a second story from Rebecca Valentine which is going to dive into another aspect of this story Valve offers explanation for October drop in Steam traffic so this is like another part another another side of the of the cube that is the story surrounding Steam and Epic Games and everything that's going on. This, I think we touched on last week. Mm, don't think no, so. I wasn't here last week. No, no, we definitely <laughs> didn't. Ago, we were going on about um, when I was last on, I think we were going on about there were some people complaining about a bug in the discovery code. There are many was, bugs in the discovery queue. That yeah, is which is the cube. Less than <laughs> <laughs> that is another side of the cube which we'll get to for now all I'll say is after a number of indie developers took to social media and Steamworks to complain about a loss in October traffic to their games Valve has offered an explanation for the sudden drop the concerns are outlined best by Jake Burkett of Green Alien Games in a blog post a few days ago though they've been echoed by a number of other developers across Twitter Burkett says that in early October some sort of bug in Steam's discovery algorithm kicked in causing it to only recommend big name titles instead of relevant smaller games. As a result, traffic to his games took a hit and Burkett says the lower traffic has persisted since from sources such as other products, pages and homepage. Then, Valve published a blog post explaining what the issue was. Per the post, a change on October 5th intended to give sales and wishlist activity more weight when answering search queries had the unintended, an unintended side effect of de-boosting games in the more like this section of Steam. The algorithm would show games with only one common tag, or with only one tag in common, rather than a large amount of tags, meaning the most popular games were always shown. Keep that sentence in mind for the next part of the, the podcast. Though this issue was fixed on October 9th, other factors over the course of the month, including an experiment in the more like this section of the store and a need to increase tag similarity weighting, caused the lower traffic to persist for the rest of the month for a number of games. Valve concludes that traffic recovered around October 19th and has stabilized since. Sure it has. 
Quote, in general, we're always trying to show games to customers that we think they will enjoy, no matter who made them, what the budget was, when they came out, etc. We're constantly exploring ideas and trying new things to try to figure out the best ways to do this. The fact is, traffic is going to shift whenever we do this work. It may go up or it may go down for any individual product. However, not all impressions and views are equal. In the end, what matters is what we show customers games that they find interest. Is that we show customers games that they find interesting, end quote. So... The other part of this story, not only are the indie game indie games developers now getting shafted on revenue sharing compared to their AAA brothers, but they're also getting shafted in, in the algorithms. Because if we go back up to uh, to the to the previous news story, I've got a quote here. Uh, shit, uh, from Jake Baquet of Grey Alien Games. <laughs> Um, since Valve destroyed my revenue at the start of October with some changes to Discovery, whether they take 30% or less doesn't make much difference, sadly. I'd rather they just fixed what broke, what they broke slash changed. Um, the insinuation here from Burkett and several other developers over on Twitter is, of course, that despite Steam saying that, well, Valve saying that they've fixed this bug, the, they haven't. <laughs> or whatever they've changed has screwed over a bunch. There's a bunch of any developers and they were sharing the graph because they've got graphs. I don't have, I didn't put any of the graphs in here, um, which show yeah. what their sales look like. You can see the sale, you can see the, sorry, not their sales, the click through. So like people visiting this, the game store page and you can see the flat line in October, which doesn't really recover. <laughs> it comes back up a bit around about when Valve say they fixed this bug. But it never gets back to where it was before. Um, and this is what happens when you rely on algorithms to drive a storefront. <laughs> mm -hmm. And this is what happens. I mean, take everything that we've just read, Keith. Yeah. Everything that we've just learned about Steam. And now filter that through the lens of Epic Games, Storefront. 88% revenue split, no algorithms, curated. I mean, yeah. Do we see where this? Do we see where where this train is is heading? Um, I mean, did the the what we've always said, but reason that there needs to be competitive Steam online was it will get Steam to change the way it's working. Because at the moment, it's all like. Anything they do doesn't really matter a hundred percent because there's no competitor for them to be undercut by, like that other people would go to. But now yeah. they're gonna to have to be more on board when it comes to stuff like this. Yeah. Um, in the whole way they run their marketplace. Because super giant games to the casual mm -hmm. gamer. I don't mean casual gamer as the insult, I mean to the casual gamer who doesn't play very many games every year. Um yeah. that's nothing. That doesn't matter. But in the PC space, Supergiant Games is very well known. They made Bastion, they made Transistor, they made Pyre, and Epic Games has, has got them. Yeah. They launched their new game in early access on the Epic Games Store. Not yeah. on Steam. Ashen has launched on the Epic Games Store. Not on Steam. Satisfactory is coming out on the Epic Games Store. <laughs> like, there's tons of games. You can go through the list. There's actually got tons. There's not that many, but there's a few games on that list. Super Meat Boy Forever is coming out on the Epic Games Store. We just saw that in the Kind of Funny Showcase. Yeah. Um, they're giving away a free game every two weeks. From In like a few days, you're going to be able to get Subnautica for free. Two weeks after that, you're going to be able to get the original Super Meat Boy. Like, they're doing all of the right things out of the gate to potentially bring more indie developers over. Mm -hmm. And that's bad news for Steam. When you look at Steam's front page and you see what is on there, like it's nearly next to impossible to find the new releases anymore because it's all algorithm driven. Discovery queues, what's popular, specials, this is on sale, this is similar to a game you've played four years ago. Tell us, great go, danger zone. That's what's on the front page of Steam. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's the thing, like. We didn't, I didn't put it in the news. So Can't Strike Go is relaunched as a free-to-play game with a Battle Royale mode. Um, drink! Drink! That's my new thing. 
<laughs> but anyway, algorithms, man. Like you drive your storefront with algorithms, and this they they're doubling down again on this algorithm, which has screwed over a bunch of Indian developers, and they're constantly exploring ideas and trying new things to figure out the best way to do this. And the traffic's gonna shift, and they fixed it, and they've done this. And so, what I did when I read this news story was I went on Steam, I went on my old Steam account, and I went, you know what? I've got a discovery queue sitting right here. Waiting for me to go through it. And what I expected to find was a bunch of AAA games that I hadn't I've played on other platforms, which is no fault of Steam's to not know yeah. that I played X game on my PlayStation. But that's not what I found. <laughs> what I found was far stranger. So let's go through my discovery queue. The first game on my discovery queue was the Mind Hero. Never heard of that? I don't blame you, I've never heard of it either. As it turns out, The Mind Hero is an anime visual novel, which was on my queue because, quote, it's new on Steam. It's so new, it doesn't have a release date, and you can't buy it. So I'm glad I discovered that game. Yeah, it might have been, like, taken off for the, you know, the whole community thing that they did a while back. I mean, let's also not forget that, no, it's it's available soon, as in it's not out yet. <laughs> that was the first one. I mean... It ties it ties in well with all the all of maybe two visual novels I've played on Steam. I know you definitely played two because Doki Doki Literature Club and Starlight Vega or something. Doki Doki Literature Club, Starlight Vega, Valhalla. I don't know if that counts. So let's say three. Just let's give them the benefit of the doubt. Out of the nearly nine hundred games I have on Steam, three of them are visual novels. So I can see exactly why this ended up in my Steam Discovery queue. But it gets better. My second game in my queue, my Discovery queue, was Artifact. Valve's brand new card game. I know exactly why this has ended up on, on everybody's Discovery queue, because it's Valve's new game. But again, it sits well next to the zero card games I've played on Steam. So, so far, the algorithm is doing a great job of recommending me games that it shouldn't think I'm interested in. Because if it's meant to be driven by tags and things and all this other stuff of games that I've played, I shouldn't be seeing these games, right? Right? I mean, I've, I've out like out of nine hundred games on Steam, I've none of them are, are card games. I would say that you like given like the way you play games on Steam because you you're reviewing, you might be a bit of a weird one for the algorithm. But I've seen enough weird stuff appear on my algorithms. I mean. That my to know that this isn't an isolated incident. That's why I just assumed I would be shown a bunch of new releases when yeah. I went in. If I was shown a bunch of new releases, I wouldn't. We wouldn't be doing this. I wouldn't be going through all of my the games on my my uh, my algorithm because it would be like, oh, it's working as I would imagine it would work for somebody who reviews games on Steam. This isn't working compared to games that I've played. Anyway, let's keep going. Edge of Eternity, an early access RPG. Which actually makes sense. It's a JRPG. I've been playing Final Fantasy VII for streams. It makes perfect sense that Edge of Eternity would end up on on my algorithm queue. The next game, Farming Simulator 19. You don't go into simulate as much. The last simulator game I played was Shower With Your Dad Simulator. And the last farming game I played was Stardew Valley. Farming Simulator Maybe 9. Maybe Stardew Valley is similar. <laughs> it's really not. I've seen Farming Simulator. It's not. And again, when I'm talking about all of these games, I'm not dissing the games. It's not about dissing the games. You like Farming Simulator? Cool, go for it. Farming Simulator, I don't like it. I don't want to play it. It should never... It, it, there's no way Steam's algorithm could look at my library, look at what I've played, look at my most popular games and go, Farming Simulator. But it gets better. X4 Foundations, which is a flight sim space thing. Again, I don't know how many of those types of games I've played on Steam, but I have to. I assume the answer is closer to zero than it is to five. Behold a two point and click indie adventure game. Totally get that. Monster Hunter World. I mean, I can't blame Steam for not knowing I didn't. I played this in January on Xbox. Football Manager 
I remember you playing football manager. Yeah, you do. How about I believe you were 16. Uh... I was a child and Steam wasn't a thing. Yeah. <laughs> when I played oh, football I manager. I think when you played that game. <laughs> Steam didn't exist. Steam might have existed, but it was for Half-Life. Ring of Elysium, a free-to-play early access battle royale game. Now, in fairness to Steam's algorithm, I've played hundreds of hours of battle royales, but I've played a grand total of about six on Steam. Yeah, you got the Xbox version of uh, Battlefield. I got the Xbox version of PUBG. I played the Xbox version of Call of Duty. <laughs> I played Fortnite for about forty-five minutes on PlayStation. <laughs> like I've never played a battle royale on Steam. I played PUBG for a bit, intermittently, maybe four times over the course of two years. Uh, the next one was Wallpaper Engine. I just put question marks because I was like, "What? I, why? What?" <laughs> Wallpapers as in desktops or wallpapers and papering the wall? It's in desktops, making your own wallpapers for your, for your computers. Uh, the next one was just Cause 4, which I guess is on there because it's brand new. But it's got a, and when I clicked on it, it had a 34% <laughs> on the uh, user review score. And because uh, it's really buggy, apparently. So apparently, Steam thinks I want that. And the last one is Black Squad, which is a free to play multiplayer shooter in early access. Again, I don't think I play that many of those types of games on Steam. Um, every single one of those games from Art, like Mind Hero was on there because it's new on Steam, that's what it said. Everything else from Artifact all the way down to Black Squad. Underneath where it says why this is in your queue. It's sad, and I'm, it's sad because it's popular. Because it's popular. So this bug that Valve has apparently fixed, with the bug itself, the algorithm would show games with only one tag in common rather than a large amount of tags, meaning the most popular games were always shown. The algorithm, when I clicked on this, apparently when Steam had fixed their algorithm, was literally showing me 90 plus percent of the games it was showing me because they're popular. And they've fixed this algorithm, apparently. And popular just means that you've hit a specific number of like people playing it. Yeah, concurrent user base. Uh, yeah, or sales, or both. Some sort of mad black magic voodoo mixture of both. It's like, it's bollocks. <laughs> magic voodoo mixture. Yeah, black magic voodoo mixture of... That, that, that sounds like either a really good game or Jazz Fusion Man. You know, X squared plus Y cubed equals Z to the power of three. Like, <laughs> I don't know, right? Um, um, yeah, it's... it's, it's we've, we've always alluded to the fact that we think that the Steam store algorithm that's supposed to show games doesn't work. And so I thought I'd put it... Put, I thought I'd put my money where my mouth is. And actually have a look at the Steam Store algorithm and go, okay, what's it recommending to me? Me with a massive, massively diverse taste in games. All of the popular games, as it turns out. And most of them of game types that I don't play. Like Farming Simulator and Football Manager. <laughs> good job, Steam. You're doing a really good job. Whew. Anything to chime in with on this that's it yeah for the steam and epic games news story with that's everything i've got yeah i was gonna go for mine quickly but uh it, steam just wanted to download stuff so i'm not gonna bother <laughs> okay i was gonna say i'll be interested to see yours because you're over more focused yeah i mean both are gonna like roulette and go for the first game on my discovery queue what's the number one game on your discovery queue right now well, um, Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Brilliant. That's absolutely brilliant. Bravo, Steam. Bra fucking vo. <laughs> because I've played adventure, single player, RPG, and action games. It's you spent 95% of your time playing Pathfinder and Civ. Yeah. The next game is Artifact. Mine came in two as well. That's weird. It's almost like it's the second one hidden behind the first one in the queue. Mm. It's because I played strategy. Civ. Really? Yeah. 
really? Monster Hunter World because I played RPGs and action games. Monster Hunter. Farming Simulator 19. Uh huh. Because I played single player in simulation. I I'm don't seeing think a I've, pattern here. I, I don't think I've ever played any simulation games. I'm seeing I'm seeing a pattern here. Artifact, Monster Hunter, Farming Simulator. Keep going. Yeah. Uh, next one's Tomb Raider. Uh, Shadow of the Tomb Raider. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. It, it do doesn't know that I've played because I'm not, it knows I've played the first one on Steam, but I played the second two on Xbox. That's your version of Edge of Eternity for me, where it's like, yeah, it makes sense that this will be on my list because. Yeah. Uh, Mutant Year Zero, Road to Eden, because I've played Battletech. Nope. Do you know why you would like Mutant Year Zero? Because you played XCOM, but go on. X4 Foundation, because I've played action and simulation games. Again, I don't think I've ever played a simulation game. X4 is the one on your list as well, isn't it? It is, yes. And I just want to put it out there. The reason why... Manager 2019... <laughs> Because I played Two Point Hospital. Sorry, could you just repeat that? Football Manager 2019 because I played Two Point Hospital. Because he's played Two Point Hospital. And the reason why we're comparing why we're, we're why we're pointing out the ones that are similar is because we have very different playing habits on Steam. <laughs> I have his playing habits in general most of the time. In general, but uh, on, especially on Steam. On consoles, we tend to play the same games. On Steam, we tend to play wildly different games. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the fact that we had like four games that appeared on both of our lists, which are really out unusual, is not great. Um, this one may be hard to pronounce. Katamari Damacy Reroll. Katamari Di Diamond. Katamari yeah. Diamond C. Yeah. yeah no. uh, because it's got a great soundtrack. It's not a dancing game, though, or a rhythm game. Yeah, I, I, I haven't played the rhythm thing. Then it's Thronebreaker, The Witcher's Tale, because I played Pathfinder. Thronebreaker, Thronebreaker if you remember, is a card game. Yeah, and Pathfinder, uh, Pathfinder Kingmaker is it's basically a CRPG. Yeah, it's a CRPG. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a CRPG based on a board game. Got a bit on a tabletop role playing module for uh, Pathfinder. Uh, <laughs> that one's a bit weird. One more. Oh, NBA 19. Because I played a simulation. NBA, did you just say? NBA 2019 or 2K19, which has got mostly negative reviews. How have you ended up with more sports games than me? I don't know. And again, it's same because I played a simulation. I don't know what games I've played, which is what simulation. Hours, but only count as a simulation. I would think, but obviously there's no, there's no similarities between Two Point Hospital and Football Manager or NBA X Four. Yeah, the only game that I've ever played which is close to NBA is Pyre. because <laughs> I Eldridge basketball. I mean, I <laughs> said. I don't know if anything else needs to be said there. Out of all of those games, if you had never played them, because I know you've played Shadow of the Tomb Raider, but let's just say you've never played any of those games on your on your list. How many would you would you be interested in buying? How many would you add to your wish list? Including Shadow what? of the Tomb Raider. Yeah, one, Shadow of the Tomb Raider. Yeah. I look at mine and I see two. Edge of Eternity and Monster Hunter World. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't add monster, but you get what I mean. Yeah. But they fixed their algorithm. It's the fact that we got four games on both our lists in pretty much the same positions. Uh, yeah. Four games neither of us are interested in. Yeah. But that... that I mean, yours were saying really, like, because they're really popular. So mine was saying stuff like those simulations of, like, action. Yeah. <laughs> I don't get it. <laughs> I don't understand like, how the algorithm works. All I know is it doesn't work. The last time I played in a fighter like aircraft was in Halo 4. <laughs> when me, you, and Russell all tried to do the end run on Legend. Was it Legendary? Yeah, yeah, we did. Yeah. That was the last Halo game I ever attempted Legendary on. 
I mean, that seems like as good a place as any to, to end that discussion. Yeah. I mean, I, th I say we just let our algorithms speak for themselves at this point. Yeah. I mean, I know it took it with a small sample size, but I think there are some significant results with the placement of some of those games. Uh, yeah. I mean, like I said, I said, keep that sentence in mind about them. It's not supposed to just go, it's popular, therefore... Mm -hmm. Here's a recommendation. That's exactly what the algorithm does. Yeah. Anyway. Epic Games, Steam, it's going to be an interesting story to follow throughout 2019. For now, let's talk about the story we've been following for the end of 2018. Um, Bethesda sending a canvas bags to Fallout 76 Power Armor Edition customers. Now, we missed this story last week. Um, but it was about halfway done. And now it's got a conclusion. Whether it's a satisfying conclusion, well, I'll ask Keith when um, I finish reading this story, which is written by Eric Kane over at Forbes, who writes, Baggate may soon draw to a close as Fallout 76 publisher Bethesda is finally doing right by its customers. Following the launch of the game, superfans who spent $200 on the special Power Armor edition of the game discovered that instead of the nice canvas bag that was advertised when they pre-ordered, Bethesda had sent out cheap nylon bags instead. The revelation was made worse when Bethesda's customer service responded in a less than helpful man manner, sparking more outrage and frustration among players and some severe articles in the press. The cherry on top might have been when it came to light that prior to the game's launch, Bethesda had given out free canvas bags to popular influencers on YouTube and Twitch. It wasn't the same bag as the one that was supposed to come with the Power Armor Edition, but the insult was added to the injury nonetheless. It was actually significant because uh, the customer service response that was alluded to in there, um, originally Bethesda's original story was um, they couldn't get a hold of the nylon to make the bags. And then it surfaced that they'd given out a bunch of nylon bags to YouTube YouTubers and Twitch streamers. <laughs> Continuing. Um, the nylon bags are the ones people received. Do you mean canvas? Yes. Canvas. Right. Everything I just said, but with the word canvas in place of nylon. My mistake. Yeah. To the super fans who paid $200 for the game, Bethesda had only given 500 atoms in-game currency for Fallout 76, worth about $5. Fun fact. It costs 700 atoms to buy the canvas bag in-game. So people couldn't even buy the canvas bag <laughs> for their character in-game to make up for the fact that they weren't getting one in real life. Finally, however, Bethesda came to its senses and decided to make this latest controversy go away. Instead of just offering a paltry sum of in-game currency, not even enough to purchase a canvas bag in the game proper, the publisher will now send out nicer canvas bags to anyone who purchased the Power Armor Edition and submits a support ticket before January 31st. Quote, We are finalizing manufacturing plans for the replacement canvas bags for the Fallout 76 Power Armor Edition, Bethesda tweeted. If you purchase the CE, please visit our website and submit a ticket by January 31st, 2019, We'll arrange to send you a replacement as soon as the bags are ready. Uh, Bethesda's just going all in on just being... hapless? Is that a good way to describe it? <laughs> we did a video uh, once. We did a video once. Following... Just before the release of Mighty Number no. 9. Um, when a trailer came out. Uh, and which included oh. the, the phrasing uh, you'll, you'll make the bad guys cry like an anime fan on prom night, which prompted Keith to ask a question about when video game marketing goes wrong. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, should we make... One of the ideas I had for videos next year was we make sequels to certain topics um, yeah. that we've have talked about in the past. Should we make a, a part of, of when video game marketing goes wrong power armor edition video? <laughs> Because um, Fallout 76 has certainly been in the news a lot. It, it's been in the news a lot. Um, and I hadn't heard anything about this, mostly because I had heard all our stories about Fallout 76. Um, mostly around people complaining about bugs or trying to get a class action lawsuit against them for releasing such a game <laughs> in the first place. Oh, you missed the insane homophobic yeah. attacks uh, last week as well in game. But to be fair to Bethesda, oh, yes. as we talked they about, banned. yeah, as me and yeah. Patrick talked about in the last episode, they did the right thing and they banned the, the guy for life. So. But, I mean, 
it's bad for Fallout. It's bad for Bethesda. It's bad for Fallout 76. Like, it's not just confined to the bugs in the game anymore. But some of this stuff, they're shooting themselves in both feet with some of this stuff because they're doing it to themselves. Which is a perfect yeah. segue into the next news story. <laughs> yeah. Bethesda leaked Fallout 76 customers' names, addresses, and contact details. This is from Tom Phillips over at Eurogamer. Who writes, Just when you think it couldn't get any worse for, Beth- worse for Bethesda, it goes and leaks a lot of personal user information to other customers. The data protection breach happened last night as customers filing support tickets with Bethesda began receiving support tickets from other people too, which included usernames, names, addresses, and other contact details. Screenshots posted to Twitter showed customers had somehow been given access to details usually confined to Bethesda's own internal customer support system, which was full of complaints about Fallout 76 bags that Bethesda is now going to replace. The majority of complaints were about Fallout 76, but customers writing in with other issues also had their details exposed. On Reddit, someone with access to the system said they could see the last four digits of another customer's credit card number. Bethesda has not yet said how this all happened, but has acknowledged the incident and apologized and said it acted quickly to seal the breach. Quote, we experienced an error with our customer support website that allowed some customers to view support tickets submitted by a limited number of other customers during a brief exposure window. Upon discovery, we immediately took down the website to fix the error, end quote. And then it talks about how they're still investigating it. I mean, I need to move yeah. my microphone here. Technology is wonderful when it works. Bethesda is a, I'm sorry, Bethesda is a video game developer. I mean, they work with technology on a daily basis. Okay. Do you have anything to say about this before I, I say what I'm going to say next? Okay. I'm taking bets. What we, what on earth are Bethesda going to do to shoot themselves in the feet next week? On next week's podcast, when we talk about Bethesda, which we inevitably will, what's going to have happened? <laughs> what are they going to have possibly done this time? Release a patch that breaks the game even more? That, that I was trying to think of what would break the game even more. Ship the bags out to the Power Armor Edition customers, but they don't have handles. Like, at a certain point, you think of the most abs- you think within reason of the most absurd thing that could possibly happen to Bethesda, and it's probably going to happen within the next month. <laughs> I just don't know anymore. I just don't know. This story is wild. It's a wild, wild ride. Of craziness. Um, okay. Keith, I'm going to ask you a question. Do you know how long we've been recording for? Because my timer's not working. <laughs> Roughly. I'm afraid I don't. Okay. Um, it's been... One week since... Probably an hour. Sorry? It's probably been about an hour. Okay, then. Anthem demo sessions are coming in January and February. This is from Andy Choco over at PC Gamer who writes, If you didn't get into this weekend's alpha test for Bioware's upcoming Destiny like Anthem, or if you just decided to take a pass until it's a little closer to completion, you'll still have the opportunity to try it for free before launch. EA has announced that two demo sessions will take place prior to release, one set for January for VIPs and another set for the rest of us in February. The VIP demo will run from January 25th to 27th, 2019, and will be available to anyone who has pre-ordered Anthem or has an EA Access or Origin Access subscriber. The open demo will run from February 1st to 3rd, 2019, and will be open in a while. Keith, how hyped are you for Anthem? Bear in mind, this is a topic for conversation for a Game Awards video because they did a trailer, but quickly, how hyped are you for Anthem? Um, four out of ten. Fair enough. How hyped are you for Dragon Age? Um, I want another Dragon Age, but I know it's a long way off. It is a long way off. How about you for Joker and Persona 5? <laughs> and, yeah, and Smash sure. Brothers. <laughs> With a Persona stage, Persona music in Smash Brothers. I was pointing out to someone that the female inkling looks a lot like Futaba. If you look at it, it's just holding up the, the case of the game. Like, it does look a lot like Futaba. Uh, yeah. Actually, yeah. <laughs> You're right. You are right, actually. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, like... 
Yeah, she is, and uh, she does look a lot like she does look a lot like Futaba. Um, Oracle, right. what are you doing with Waragon? Wait, how did you get here? <laughs> they sent the invitation to me. I've uh, got a new story here that Mike Laidlaw is now working at Ubisoft Quebec. If you don't know who that is, that's the former Dragon Age creative director. And he's joined Quebec, the studio behind Assassin's Creed Odyssey. In the studio blog post, it's all not it's noted that Laidlaw has been consulting with Quebec on an unannounced project for the past nine months. So the, the studio that basically made Assassin's Creed a Bioware RPG just hired the former Dragon Age creative director. On the face of it, the new it wasn't the news didn't blow me away until I connected some dots. <laughs> and yeah. I was like, wait. <laughs> Interesting. Keith has nothing. Former Final Fantasy XV director Hajim Tabata announces JP Games. This is from Matthew Kate over at Game Informer, who says, After leaving Square Enix less than a month ago, Final Fantasy XV director Hajim Tabata has announced his new company, JP Games, and that is all the information we have. Yeah. I mean, he, he did a good job on Final Fantasy XV, so... They're preparing to launch JP Games in January of next year. Do you think... Because we talked about... You were there, right? We talked about when he left, because it was very sudden. <clears throat> and one of the theories that I posited was that rather than make Final Fantasy XVI, Tabata saw an opportunity after somehow yeah. getting Final Fantasy XV across the finish line to yeah. make his dream game. Yeah. Do you think that lead lends into that? To yeah. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. it's definitely going to get funding. Yeah. He's the dude who managed he's the dude who got Final Fantasy fifteen, not just launched, but launched to a point where it was actually really well received and sold really well. Yeah. That shouldn't have been possible. I think I remember us saying we got the figures beforehand, before Final Fantasy fifteen came out. And and we were talking about on the podcast of how many copies it would need to sell to break even, bearing in mind it had been in development for ten years and had been rebooted like three times. Yeah. And I think they did it. <laughs> Like, I think they actually broke even on the development of Final Fantasy XV. For that, Tabata should have been made president of the fucking company. Like, <laughs> but if he's getting there's his there's his yeah, there's a no. He just he 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 had like a Nam style flashback to like he was like, "We're gonna make you the face of the Final Fantasy franchise." So like, you're gonna be the. You're gonna be the said the guy, you know. He's all fine, and he had like the Nam style flashbacks to the development of fifteen, and just ran out the door, or ran through a wall, and there was just a tabata shaped hole <laughs> through the wall, and they were just like, "Should we put out a press release?" <laughs> Are you kidding? Sorry, Star Trek six reference. Yeah. <sighs> The boy Yomato is going back playing concerts next year. This is from Yomato's blog. Uh, and it says, Hello, this is Nobuo Yomatsu. It's been a while since I last updated my blog, and I'm sorry to make you all worry. I haven't yet decided when I'll be back composing, but from next year I'm planning on attending domestic concerts little by little. Thank you. So obviously uh, back in September we talked about Yomatsu. Um, pretty much stopped working because of his declining health, and it sounds like he's getting better. Yeah. Which is good. It's a very good thing. Very happy about that. Now, Keith, you wouldn't think that Shadow of the Tomb Raider demo swings out would be a news story worthy of the words about Gamescast. And ordinarily, you'd be right. But, but I've read the blurb that someone has done for this, and it's wonderful. When I read this paragraph written by Alice O'Connor of Rock Paper Shotgun, it was like that time we did the video game haikus. I just, I, could, I had to put it in. So... We've all seen Lara Croft's origin story a hundred times. Bitten by a radioactive tomb, she gained great power and unslakable bloodthirst. But when her father was killed in, alley, in an alley by a cursed string of pearls she had raided herself, she realised she had a great responsibility to do errands for the indigenous peoples she's robbing. If you wish once again to discover how Lara Croft became the Tomb Raider, however, you're in luck as a demo for Shadow of the Tomb Raider is out now. <laughs> you just gotta love it, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, somebody! I, just love, I, I love the thing where it goes uh, do errands for the indigenous people she's robbing because spoiler alert is is something which happens a lot. Spoiler alert: 
That's what happens in Tomb Raider games. <laughs> in the, the re- I mean, in, in the first reboot game, no, because no, there's no one left. Game. Yeah. Yeah, uh, in the second one, kind of not really, maybe a little, but then the third one, it is pretty much what's going yeah, on. Because... It's like, you're changing her own guilt. By <laughs> because the you got two you got the Tomb Raider reboot trilogy and then you've got Tomb Raider which is bridging yeah. right and obviously in the original Tomb Raider games that's exactly what she's doing <laughs> like she's the fucking Tomb Raider so you yeah. think as they get she gets closer and closer at that moment it's like she's gonna start stealing shit from indigenous peoples but I mean at least she feels bad about it <laughs> never showed me feeling bad about it she just does stuff and we, we, we draw conclusions based on her actions uh yeah, we do. Minor spoiler. I once saw a silver murder. There was little reason for Lara Croft to suddenly become a detective, but fair enough. Why not? Just fuck it, right? Do yeah. It. I forgot I put that up. Sorry, I just noticed in my background, because I've just tilted the webcam up slightly, because I'm sitting in a different chair, I've just noticed I've got the pause card that Bethesda sent me for uh, the launch of Fallout 76 in the background I forgot I put it up do you want to see nice. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean I won't show you the back of it because it's got my address on it but here's the front of it <laughs> fall out <laughs> reclamation day yeah There'll be another one in the future where they try and claw back and reclaim their credibility. Uh, It's called Starfield. (laughs) Yeah, which everybody is now quite worried about. Keith, that's going to do it for episode 139 of the Words About Games cast. Thank you for joining me. Pleasure for always. If you want, again, like I said at the top of the show, if you want to hear our thoughts or some thoughts. About the game awards and the kind of funny game showcase we're gonna have videos of that coming out on wednesday obviously we've still got impressions videos coming out we've got about two weeks left until we take a break for christmas something like that so plenty of video games because all the video games are coming out in december it's fucking crazy i hate it what the hell happened i'm supposed to be slowing down <laughs> in the run-up to this not anymore. Apparently <laughs> not. But we're going to do a Christmas quiz, right? Yeah, there was a Christmas quiz. We just need to rinse. Christmas quiz. We're going to end the year on the Christmas quiz again. But for now, let's just say bye. Say bye, Keith. Bye, Amy. Bye, Keith. Bye. 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 Don't leave bye. me.